Let's talk A New Hope. Welcome back. This is episode 14 of the Force with Friends podcast. My name is Will with the Padawan Pops channel, and this is my friend and co-host Kevin. And we have been walking through the story of Star Wars over the last few weeks. So we have done the Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith, and we are officially in the original trilogy starting today and the next few weeks. So <laughs> if you are new to this, our goal here is to bridge all of the Star Wars story from episode one to nine as one continuous story. So we're just breaking it down as if it's one story start to finish, which technically it is. But we're trying to weave those themes together from start to finish. And we hope that this is something that helps you enjoy the movies a little bit more. Starting on this episode, we have a few different topics that we're going to be working through. And so we will start with the Death Star. We'll move to the Twins, then the Master, then the Father. So Kevin, in episode two, we're first introduced to the Death Star. We just, it's almost in passing when they're on Geonosis, they see yeah. the plans of the Death Star. In episode three, we see the Emperor and Vader overlooking the construction of the Death Star. Yeah. In Rogue One, which we haven't talked about, but Rogue One, it's all about the Death Star and then yeah. stealing the plans for it. And so you jump to episode four, and the Death Star is Palpatine's new endgame for his empire. Yeah, no, that that I, I do like how the original trilogies, the Death Star just kind of pops up. But yeah. then they had I feel like there's been a lot of projects that really have kind of expanded on its lore. And I, I do like that the Separatists have this plan. They're like, hey, we got this big weapon. Of course, Palpatine knows it's his, right? He's he's not going to let it stay in the hands of the Separatists. And then, right. Um, but yeah, between Rogue One and even Andor, uh, to an extent, right, we see kind of the forced enslavement disguised as arresting people for stupid crimes. That's how they're getting it built. And yes. Um, and then uh, uh, Catalyst, if you've read the Catalyst book, that's a really good book that kind of leans into the, it's it's kind of Galen Erso's backstory yeah. leading into Rogue One. Uh, that's another really good one. So I, I do like how they've really enriched kind of the backstory of this giant super station, the size of a moon that just pops up out of nowhere in A New Hope. So, yep. And I do have Catalyst. I just haven't read it. I have books more for decoration than I have <laughs> for for reading at this point. But yeah, the the Death Star is the the antagonist of the original trilogy, in my opinion. Yeah. It's it's the big bad guy for Episode Four, uh, Episode Five. They're looking for revenge for what happens to the Death Star, and then Episode Six, we have a new one. And then you uh, you get into the sequel trilogy and it's all about Death Star copies all the way <laughs> throughout. Yeah. So going forward, the idea of this Death Star is a really big thing in Star Wars. Episodes one through three, it was the clones. Episodes mm -hmm. really four through nine, we're looking at Death Star tech is, is what our rebels are fighting against. Yeah, it seems like Palpatine's plan is always to have something ready just that's that's overwhelming force whether yep. it's order 66 or now the death star um you see that really throughout all nine movies that he always has a plan to have something in place yeah. to to make sure that his his power is greater than anything else out there so yeah yep. Death star is just the next i mean it's the next step in his plan to make sure his empire stays safe so for sure so bridging this gap from three to four and this mm -hmm. this idea of the death star we see the construction in three as if we've just watched three, absolutely nothing else, and are going straight into four. We we end seeing the Death Star there, and then we begin start talking about the plans of this Death Star. So we're aware mm -hmm. of what's going on to an extent. Um, Vader is, is trying to make sure that these rebels don't have the plans, and that really drives the whole film. So uh, the plans are on... R2 and C-3PO, Princess Leia gives it to them. They're jettisoned to Tatooine where Luke Skywalker comes into possession of R2 who has the plans. And yep. so the entire movie really is chasing these plans down. 
which we know from Rogue One, there was a lot that happened to get these plans. And then once this rebellion has the plans, we start this this full scale attack on taking down this Death Star. Now, I think we also have to touch a little bit on the rebellion here because it is a huge part of Star Wars. Just trying to weave it in. I didn't know if we had enough time for that extra topic. But we end episode three with a full blown empire that, you know, has just toppled the Republic. They've got yeah. an army we know throughout the Bad Batch and Andor and and let's see, Kenobi and Rogue One. The Empire is at full strength now. So yeah. when we get to episode four, it's the Empire, they're in power, but there's also this rebel cell. And so there's this resistance to the empire. And once we get to the twins, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. But it's important to see here that this Death Star is only such a big deal because there is a group that is trying to destroy the Death Star as well. So that's where this tension is going to come into play in this movie. Yeah, for sure. And I I I remember how fun it was watching this movie for the first time. Just those because you know those plans are there, but you just don't know. You don't know what's in yeah. it. You don't know what's going on with it. How are they going to blow up this thing the size of a moon? So I, especially for watching the movie the first time, those plans really drive that sense of suspense. There's not really any way they can blow this thing up. So what is what is it that R2 has that really is going to make this possible? And so, yeah. like you said, that's the driving force behind this, is getting those plans to a point where they can be acted on. And that's that's yeah. kind of where most of the movie takes us, is just trying to figure out what's in R2. Um, yeah. That's going to solve this problem of the Death Star. Like you said, the Death Star is really the antagonist here. Yeah. And with the Death Star as well, you get. So in episode three, the clones were Palpatine's big plan. He needed to overwhelm mm -hmm. the Jedi to take control of the whole galaxy. He he needed them to be gone out of the way so he could he could pretty much just waltz right in and take over. So now that he has done that and taken over, he doesn't need the clones anymore, but he does need this super weapon, he feels like, to maintain control yeah. in the galaxy. So he has a planet killer, and we see it in full strength blowing up Alderaan in episode four. And the idea here is that anyone who has any issues with the Empire, well, we're going to blow up your whole planet. We don't care. So he's really going with ruling by power and strength. And so if he has this weapon, there is nothing that can stop him from ruling the galaxy essentially forever in his mind because he's never going to yeah. die. Yeah, that's always been his goal, that live forever and run his empire. Yeah, I'd, um, I'd, I'd really love to see something give us the scene where he dissolves the Senate. Because this is really the signal that Palpatine's no longer political anymore. He's done doing stuff yeah. behind the scenes, the sneaky stuff, the manipulation. He's like, listen, I'm in control now. You guys aren't. I have this thing that'll blow up a planet and you're just going to have to deal with it. I mean, that's essentially yeah. where he's at now is he has completely removed any sort of deception in his plans now. And it ha it's become sheer terror and brute force is is what he's ruling with now. Um, yeah, but I'd love to see that scene where he gets rid of the Senate. I'd like to see the reactions and the responses um, yeah, as he does I, we'll that. We'll probably how get that it. Unfolds. I hope so. Uh, between Somewhere, somehow. the Bad Batch <laughs> and Andor, I feel like it'll show up at, at some point. Yeah. Kind of moving from here to the next topic of the twins. So we have this this Death Star and the the big issue is they need the plans. Well, who has the Death Star plans? None other than Anakin Skywalker and Padme Amidala's daughter, Princess <laughs> Leia. And then the plans from her go to Anakin Skywalker and Padme Amidala's son, Luke yep. Skywalker. It's like poetry at rhymes. You always like have destiny. Yeah. yeah, you always have Skywalkers <laughs> in the thick of it here. So yep. trying to think of how to start this, I think we should start with one twin and then probably move to the other. So we see Leia first. So it's very cool. We <clears throat> we end episode three with the twins going their separate ways. Leia goes with the Organas to Alderaan. 
Luke goes to Tatooine with his family, his aunt and uncle, and Leia is walking in the footsteps of her mother, hands down. So she's, oh, yeah. she certainly cares about her people, which was Padme Amidala's driving force in really ep- episode one for sure. She gets more into the galactic politics in two mm-hmm. or three, but she cares about her people and she cares about her galaxy and what's right for it. And what do we see Leia doing as a teenager? She cares about her people on Alderaan, but she cares about the galaxy as a whole because she is a you know major force in this budding rebellion. Her adopted yeah. father, Bell Organa, is secretly one of the main ringleaders in the rebellion. And she finds herself right in the thick of it, which is something that Padme Amidala certainly would also have done. Yeah, no, she is. She's right in the thick of it. Um, And it's interesting to see she is following in Padme's footsteps, but she also has that kind of fiery, I'm going to take charge and I'm going to do what I need to do regardless of what anybody else says around me. That's that's totally Anakin. That's Anakin. It's cool. We will get to both twins, but you see, I don't know how much... I mean, George likes to say he had it all planned out. <laughs> I, I don't know how much of that's true. He had a lot um, of plans. It worked out really well, though, because just the way these movies are and the way Anakin's portrayed in the prequels, you see a lot of him in both both characters, which is kind of kind of cool to see. And Leia's definitely inherited that fiery kind of sense of uh, justice and vengeance, like that that yeah. wrongs need to be righted, and I'm going to move forward. So I, I I like the way she's portrayed in that. And you're right, she's definitely taking the political route she's seen a lot she's not going to have the same level of naivety that luke's going to have because she's she's seen the worst she's seen Mm. what the empire's doing she's very familiar with it and so she kind of has that edge to her um that's that's of someone who understands the situation and is not i mean she's not afraid to act on anything and so right yeah we get a really good introduction to her those first couple scenes with her invader where she's just standing toe to toe with him uh, is great. She doesn't. She yeah. doesn't balk at all. And you're right. That is totally Anakin. Like I think of Anakin when he's captured with General Grievous in Episode Three, and and yeah. he's just being a smart aleck to Grievous. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's what true. she's face to face with Darth Vader, and she's face to face with Grand Moff Tarkin, and she's just slinging insults at him. She's yeah. she. I mean it's a 19 year old with, with the bad guys of the galaxy and she doesn't care. So it's definitely a lot of Anakin and Padme in her. And we see it as the movie goes on. She's a natural leader. Really. If you look at, at the group, Han Solo isn't quite there yet. Luke Skywalker isn't quite there yet. Obi-Wan is still this, this hermit Jedi. He knows what he's got to do. He's got the resolve, yeah. But he is very much a secondary character here. And Leia mm-hmm. is the leader of their group. When there's when there's question by the time they get to her, she's she's the driving force of what they're doing. She she tells Luke to suck it up. We gotta keep going. She'll tell Hein, hey, you're gonna get paid, whatever, get out of here. Like she's yeah. very much so in charge. And and that is totally a Skywalker thing. That's true. Yeah, it is very much. Yeah, because Luke and Han they're they're very much main characters, but they're not the leader. Luke's this not yet. he's he's this wide eyed kid who doesn't know half of what he's doing. And then Han he's, he's in survival mode. Han's just trying to get to the next thing to survive yeah. the next threat in the galaxy. Uh, so Leia really is the only thing that that really drives them forward in a direction that's meaningful because otherwise you know, she takes them to the base. She's the one that ultimately gets the plans there. But without her being that driving force, Han and Luke probably don't really go anywhere who knows what their their future looks like but she is i mean she's yeah. she's the driving force that gets them to where they are eventually and also kind of the last thing on leia here as far as bridging this whole story together much yeah. like <clears throat> anakin she loses everything at a very young age i think the same yeah. age as anakin anakin loses right. his mom in episode two and Padme loses everything at at age nineteen in Episode Four with with Alderaan being blown up. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, there's so a lot moving of, a lot of things that mirror between between her yeah. and obviously her father. So, and I think that some of that hindsight is very cool that that this started with Episode Four, and then you can go yeah. back to one, two, and three, and George can be like, "Oh, let's 
let's make these these illusions yeah. and these foreshadowings. It is cool, and I I don't think I've ever watched the original trilogy this close to watching the prequel, like just straight uh. through like this. So it's easier to find like, well, that doesn't make sense, like, or that that doesn't quite line up. But it is mm-hmm. cool that like a lot of the big picture stuff and a lot of the character moments are totally in line with those prequel movies, which is which is pretty neat. So, yeah. So as we move into Luke here, very different situation from Leia. Luke, like we said, yeah. he's not this natural born leader yet. Luke has lived on Tatooine, who, which is not under Imperial control, technically, right. like as far as right. it's, it's an outer rim planet. Yeah. And so it's still very much, I mean, the Empire runs everything, but, but it's a different life. He hasn't had to sit and worry about what the Empire's doing because they're so poor He's just worried about the next farming season or making sure that the Tuscan Raiders aren't doing stuff or that a sandstorm isn't coming through. It's just a completely different existence that he's had, but it's the exact same existence minus the fact that Anakin was owned by someone else. It's the same story that, that Anakin had. He didn't have this freedom to go do whatever. Anakin had a master who said, you can't leave. But Luke has an uncle yeah. who's protecting him and says, yeah. you can't leave. You've got to stay here. And in very harsh conditions, not in royalty like um, Leia would have grown up with. So it's interesting the contrast you see between the two, but then it's still the same experience of of one of the parents being Anakin. Yeah. And even, even to the fear, right, about where Luke might go. Uh, Owen makes that comment where he's like, he's got too much of his father in him. He's like, yeah, that's, that's what I'm afraid of. Right. I mean, there's, there's a question about if he goes off into this galaxy, what is he going to do? Right. What is he going to become? And so that same fear that surrounded Anakin, you see a little hints of it, even with his aunt, well, primarily his uncle right. uh, with Luke's future. And yeah, he's, he's really like young Anakin. That's, that's really where Luke kind of starts off is just naive and, he wants to get out there. He wants to see the world. He feels trapped very much like kid Anakin did back in Phantom Menace. And he has these dreams and these, these hopes. And he, he really, you touched on it, but he really has a luxury despite the fact that Leia is the one who grew up wealthy in a yeah. palace. Luke's really the one who's grown up with the luxury of just not having to worry about anything. His yeah. life is very simple. Whereas Leia's life has been anything but. And so, um, he does. He makes that comment of, of course, I don't like the Empire, but something along the lines of, but what am I going to do? I can't do anything about it. And so they have that very different mindset where Leia's seen what the Empire does and feels like she has to act, but Luke doesn't really know yet. And so he's he's just trying to make his way and do what he wants. So seeing those two sides that are very much Anakin, but have also driven them very different directions and leave them at very different points is pretty cool. Yeah, I like it, especially kind of like you said. I don't think I've watched these movies with the fine attention to detail Yeah. as far as, hey, this is one big story. A lot of times I'll just watch it as a fan would and just enjoy it. But it's a lot more than that when you look at it like this. There's all sorts of backstory going on that that play into every moment. Um, And as we learn more through especially Kenobi. We'll hit on this, I think, more as we go yeah. through. But that series, yeah. I don't think it lived up to the hype. But I still think if you're watching Kenobi and then going into episode four, or you're watching yeah. Kenobi, then Rogue One going into episode four, those two projects enrich this movie so much. You just yeah, have so much more weight to this. So when when you're watching the twins, Leia and Luke, we see, okay, this is why Owen thinks the way he does about Luke a little bit. You see that in Kenobi. Or, hey, yeah. this is why Leia thinks so highly of Obi-Wan from Kenobi. And so just little things here and there from these additional projects have added a lot to it. And it, we'll touch more on it again, especially when we talk about Obi-Wan and Vader. It's, it's going to be hard not to mention Kenobi when we talk yeah. about them. But For sure. just seeing Luke and Leia's story as as it lays out, it's just so hard not to see Padme and Anakin in these twins. And as we leave episode three, which has the twins going their separate way, coming into episode four, seeing them come back together. If you're a first time viewer, 
that's going to be a very big deal because you're like, oh, yeah. th- these are these babies, and now they're here growing up and and they're walking in their parents' footsteps. And so, kind of like what you said in our last episode, I would love to see this through the eyes of a first time viewer, yeah. just because, I mean, it would be so rewarding to have that cliffhanger in three picking yeah. right up in four when they're in the thick of it. <laughs> it would be. Yeah. And it, and cause three ends off, there's that little spark of hope and there's yeah, a lot yeah. that takes place that we have now in media in Canon yeah. that happens between episode three and episode four now, but is really just kind of keeping things in place until this hope can become something until Luke yeah. and Leia can really come onto the scene and begin to move towards this resolution of these events, right? Like if you look at the Bad Batch and Rebels and Andor, Kenobi, like all these shows that that took place in between, none of these people are really challenging the Empire, right? They're just keeping things going until this hope, right, that existed in episode three, really kind of like finally comes to light in episode four. And so these twins, right, like this is this is it. This is that hope that people have been hoping would would be in place. And now we're we're kind of to see the empire actually be challenged as they, they begin to come, come into the thick of it. So for sure. So last couple things to touch on Luke, because yeah. um, we would be remiss if we didn't add in the fact that he is force sensitive, which mm-hmm. very much Anakin and, and Obi-Wan and Yoda, they yeah. knew it was going to happen. They knew it was going to happen with both twins. Yeah. They knew with Luke and Leia, there would yeah. be a time to train them. I think Obi-Wan obviously more focused on Luke, which when we get into Empire Mm -hmm. and into Return of the Jedi, we'll talk more about Leia's potential there. But Luke is is the focal point here. And Obi-Wan takes up the mantle of training Luke. And then that's that's very much an Anakin quality. But also, we see Luke is pretty good in a starfighter as well. So that's that's an Anakin thing, too. I mean, Anakin was the best pilot in the galaxy. And then we have Luke yep. Skywalker, who may very well be the best pilot in the galaxy. So it's cool think, to see all these things. You think you think Luke could drive a pod racer? Oh, at, <laughs> at the time? No. Yeah. Probably I would say by the point. time he's 25, he could have. Yeah, he's not the chosen one. Yeah, it's just, yeah, that's how good Anakin was. I would be interested. I know it's out there, but what the official midi chlorian count for Luke is, because right, that's yeah, those how are you things get to, I do not know off the top of my head. I don't either, but that's how you get to Padres. You got a high midi chlorian count. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Luke, <laughs> Luke and Leia, very much so walking in the footsteps that we would expect them to be. Yeah, getting ready to to take on their new coming of age story, but Luke gets this spark from encountering these droids that that have the message from Leia to find Obi Wan Kenobi. Well, Luke knows a Ben Kenobi, and so that turns out to be Obi Wan's alias. So we are yep. going to go to the section of the podcast titled. The Master, which is Master Obi-Wan Kenobi. Funny thing just to throw in, it's like, well, Obi-Wan Kenobi, that would be pretty obvious. So I'm just going to go by Ben Ben Kenobi. Kenobi. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot of Kenobis in the galaxy. It's a common surname. I think it's as so. if he put on like a mustache <laughs> and those glasses. Right. And that was... So it's total Clark Kent the size. It's yeah, I'll just change my first name and no one will ever know who I am. Yeah, but yeah. we we see Obi-Wan at the end of episode three. He's going to watch over Luke from afar on Tatooine. That's going to be his his exile for the next 20 years. Yeah. We then see in Kenobi gets a little sidetracked in that exile and he leaves and he, he does have some interaction with Leia as well. So that does tie this together pretty well. Because if yeah. you're watching the original trilogy, you're probably like, well, how on earth does does Leia know that Obi-Wan is her only hope? Yeah. Well, Obi-Wan essentially saved her life from the Inquisitors, from Vader, from the Empire at a young age. And right. they built a very strong bond over the course of, I'm assuming Kenobi is like over a few weeks, I yeah. guess. I'm sure there's an answer for that that I don't know. But Obi-Wan and Leia, instead of Obi-Wan and Luke, probably have a much stronger bond up to this point. Yeah, because really, it, it, we see it in Kenobi and Luke kind of alludes to it. It's just, they seem to have a relationship kind of in passing where they've 
they've seen each other, they have a familiarity with each other, but it's not the same thing as going and saving someone's life and spending a, a week on the run as fugitives with them. And, and so, yeah, I think there's definitely a stronger bond there. And I do, I, I think you're right that Kenobi sidetracked is a good word <laughs> to throw in with Kenobi. Yeah. Cause I felt like the show itself got pretty sidetracked, but within that, yeah. there were some really good moments that, that really, like you said, it just enrich episode four in terms of, their relationship and how she knows him, but also just how Kenobi comes to this place where he's there and he's ready to immediately say, all right, let's go. I'm going to train you in the force. It's, it's a very sudden, like, let's do this type of thing where he's ready immediately to jump in and be a master again, which is not where we leave him in episode three. And so no. I, one of the things I do love about Kenobi is how it does set him up to kind of find that will to to be ready and to to wait and do the waiting, which a big part of that probably his interactions with Qui Gon, which is another thing I wish we could see. Yeah. And so all of yeah, Kenobi, you're right. Like it's it's not a part of this this story that we're talking about, but it does add so much to uh, the character in Episode Four, just in terms of understanding who this person is at this point in time. Yeah. Um, so I, I I appreciate a lot of the character stuff they did in Kenobi. Yeah, and I think when when Kenobi happened, I thought it was completely unnecessary, but I want I was looking forward to it because yeah. I mean, who, who wouldn't want you and back on screen? But I thought Absolutely. it was unnecessary. <laughs> I still think half of what happened in Kenobi was unnecessary. Yeah. With the whole inquisitor line, having the inquisitors in live action is a great idea, but having them be such a big focus, I don't think was a great idea. But the way Rogue One sets up the war aspect of Episode Four, like you watch Rogue mm -hmm. One and you go straight into Four, and you're like, "I know exactly what's happening." Kenobi sets up the spiritual force aspect of Episode Four. Of yeah. hey, we're ready to train these Jedi, and so I think Rogue One and Kenobi go hand in hand. Of of seeing, yes, there's a galaxy at war. But yes, there's the force going on as well. And you have to follow both of those trains of thought into episode four. And so looking at Master Obi-Wan Kenobi, he wasn't ready, like you said, at the end of episode three. But at the end of Kenobi, he has confronted his failure with Anakin. We see that that big battle at, at the end of Kenobi where he's fighting Vader and he apologizes for it. He says, Anakin, I'm sorry for yeah. all of it. He he gets it out there. He gets to have his one last, you know, vent session, whatever. He apologizes. Anakin says, you know, you didn't kill Anakin. I did. Yeah. Anakin's gone. And you get that, that exit of Obi-Wan and Anakin where he says, so long, Darth, or something along those lines. He's essentially conceding. Anakin's dead. Yeah. The focus now is on Leia and on Luke. And that's how Kenobi ends. And like you said, he has that sense of resolve. He's ready for when the moment happens, when it's time, he's going to jump back in. And that's where we pick up with him in episode four. Yeah. And I, I love, I mentioned it, but I love that it ends with him moving into this interaction with Qui Gon, right? Qui Gon, who, who kind of really started a lot of this stuff. And and could have been maybe a correction to a lot of the things that happen. He now gets to be a part of moving forward and resolution of this, like helping Kenobi prepare for what's ahead, um, mm -hmm. what he wasn't able to do before. His time with him was cut short, even though Obi-Wan was ready to do the trials and he was about to be out of his leadership. There, there was probably a lot of learning and wisdom there still to be passed on. And so it's cool that Qui-Gon gets to come back into this picture and continue helping Obi-Wan move towards this thing that he he really was a part of at the beginning. So I, I love that it leaves off at that point uh, with with him and Qui-Gon. Yeah, I would love to see the, the Qui-Gon interactions off screen yeah. or, or on screen, what's happened off screen, actually see right. how he does get ready. And I know there's some literature to that as well. You can kind of read into it, but I want to see it on screen as, as unlikely as that may be. But Obi-Wan, Master Obi-Wan... He he comes into contact again with Leia and Luke, and he knows it's time. And so he goes on board of, of this, 
this wild goose chase essentially to to make sure that these Death Star plans get to Yavin to the rebellion. Yeah. And as they're doing this, they they come across Alderan, which is where he's wanting to get to, and it's not there anymore. So nope. as as they're doing that, they are tractor beamed into this Death Star that we've already discussed. And at this point, Obi-Wan knows what has to happen when, when he's on that Death Star. So he goes around kind of doing his side work to, to make sure everything's going to work out. And he's trying to get the, the, the Millennium Falcon has to get away and he has to confront Vader. And that's that's Obi Wan knows at this point he has got Leia together, he's got Luke together. He mm-hmm. sees that, and at that point, he he knows things are good. So he's he's yeah. fighting Vader. That fight is not overly exciting as far as all the rest of the lightsaber duels that we have go. But yeah. knowing what we know now through Kenobi and all that leading up up to this fight i think it is a better fight with all the added information that we now have just looking at it for what it is yeah and obviously vader wins this fight and we see obi-wan he gets struck down after he sees luke and leia together that's the point where he knows mission accomplished they're together if you strike me down it doesn't matter we're gonna win it's over and Will with diamond figs. He has a great explanation of that. And in one of his videos, uh, he has lots of great videos explaining stuff. So if you can find that somewhere, go check out his channel. He explains this very well, but essentially the twins being together is Obi-Wan's goal. And so Hmm. as he sacrifices himself, he is going to push Luke all the way into this fight. He's going to push Leia even further into this fight. And he is also going to be one of the four. So it's a win, win, win for him. And that's where we leave Obi-Wan. He's went from this recluse who has failed at, at pretty much everything. And then we see him being to the point to where his success is actually just letting go. And, and Anakin, you get to win this round, but you're not going to win the war. And I think that's a really cool ending point for this character as he is alive in passing this torch on to the next generation, which obviously Ben Kenobi hangs around as a force ghost throughout all of the movies. But as far as this movie goes, we only know him for a little bit at this point yeah. for, for episode four, if you start there and it's a pretty weighty ending to this movie. Yeah. It's in a lot of ways. I, I think it's also a cool kind of reflection of like Kane and Jairus's moment. And Rebels in that episode, Jedi yep. Knight, where he understands that his time is up, right? And so he understands that he has to accomplish some things. And then in accomplishing those things, there's a point where he's going to have to let go. And he does, And right? We see it's really cool because we see the same. It's, it's the Jedi thing. You step yeah. in, you be the protector, even at the cost of your own life. And you do what has to be done. Like that's, that's the way of the Jedi to put yourself in front of harm's way as the protector of others. And so... He, that's that's how he goes out. Like if he's not there, delaying Vader, they don't stand a chance. Vader's there. He's at the Millennium Falcon. They're not going anywhere, and so he really does step in at the cost of his life and do what has to be done, knowing that he's been preparing for this moment. That, that he's been preparing to move on to kind of a different state where he's going to continue to help Luke. And so it really is a cool ending for him because. Yeah, he sacrifices himself, but he also knows. I feel like he knows this has been coming. As soon as he yeah. senses Vader there, he knows this confronta- confrontation has to take place, and that this is probably going to be the end result, especially so that they can escape. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, it, it's a good ending for him. Yeah, he knew from the minute he got on the Death Star that yeah. this was it. I want to say in the from the, from a certain point of view book. Um, the first one for A New Hope. I've read mm-hmm. the story, but it touches a little bit on that as well. But oh. Obi-Wan's story, and what what you had just said about the way of the Jedi, like putting yourself in harm's way and completing the task, that's such a major theme in Star Wars. We don't yeah. see it quite as much in the prequels, but we see it a lot. We're going to see it in Episode 4. We're going to see it in Episode 6. We're going to see it in Episode 8. 
and we're going to see it in episode nine with with Ben Solo. So that's going to be a yeah. theme that continues all the way throughout. So really, we can we can dunk on the sequels a lot, but it picks up on this theme yeah. from Rebels and A New that's Hope true. and and Return of the Jedi, and it it does carry it forward. So I think that'll be something fun to touch on in in a, a month or so when we get there. But that's where. Obi Wan's story ends. He struck down his his body is gone, but we still hear him communicating with Luke throughout the episode as Luke goes yeah. and destroys the Death Star and all this. But we'll we'll touch on that at the end here. But let's move into the father. We've kind of built up to this. We're going to backtrack a little, but yeah. we pick up the movie. We end episode three with Anakin overlooking the Death Star. We we start episode four with with Anakin as Vader. Um, he is interrogating his daughter, which he doesn't know about it, but he's, he's trying to get the plans from her. And we see at this point, Anakin Skywalker is fully gone. He's this menacing evil figure, Darth Vader. He rules with an iron fist, literally. And we see that there's no scarier of a villain that you can have. So we go from there's no greater of a hero you can have in the Clone Wars with Anakin. And we, we get to this Galactic Empire and he's the bad guy. And it's tragic because we know he was the chosen one and now he's yeah. going against that. And so if you're watching this from the perspective that this is Anakin's story, which I, I prefer to watch Star Wars from that perspective because that's what George said it should be. It's really sad because this is the first time we pick up with him completely evil all the way throughout a movie. Yeah, and not only that, but like you alluded to, he comes in contact with his daughter very early on. And it's just, it's another thing that he's missing because of what he's chosen, because of how yeah. Palpatine has pulled him into this, uh, this evil dark side of the force where he has lost who he is. It, it's the very thing he wanted, this family that he wanted these people to love him and be with him. She's right there in front of him and he can't, he can't acknowledge it. And so that's, it's just another heartbreaking piece of his life where because of what he's done, even though it's right there in front of him, he still doesn't get it. He still doesn't get to have it because of he's, he's just so far gone, like you said. Um, and I was thinking about how several times in these, these movies, so there's that, that comment of search your feelings. If there was any Anakin Skywalker in there, you have to think that Anakin might pick up on that, right? That he might sense that there's a familiarity there because they're able to when they make yeah. that comment of search your feeling, but it's true. Like there, there's an understanding in the force of, of truth. And so, right. but he's missing it because, because that's only something Anakin would pick up on. It's, it's Anakin's daughter. It's not Darth Vader's daughter. He, he doesn't get it. He doesn't get to interact with her in that way because of, because of what he's become, which is, is incredibly sad. So, yeah, I haven't I didn't really even think about it to that point that he is so closed off to that aspect of his life now and he's so just kind of resolved in the fact that his kid died when Padme died when yeah. when he killed Padme and or at least that's what Palpatine told him so that's what he thinks. So this is so far off of his radar. He's just yeah. living in a a rage now. And so as we learn in Kenobi, his singular focus for revenge is kind of what drives him at this point. Yeah. He wants Kenobi. So he has his two duels with Kenobi. He wins one, he loses the other. And at the end of Kenobi, we see the Emperor kind of scolding him, saying, hey, is this going to be an issue for you going forward? He says yeah. no. But by the time we get to A New Hope, we can see it's it's not his primary focus at this point. So he's probably moved past it yeah. to a degree. But man, once there is an opportunity to encounter Obi-Wan Kenobi, he's not exactly yeah. past this revenge he's factor. Still either. hung up on it. And I think and this is what I was talking about when I was talking about things in these movies that I don't think were ever planned. But it's cool that they're there. Things that reflect yeah. the prequel movies just out of. I guess good coincidence. I don't know, but like that—that that, the cool thing about that is that's still kind of Anakin. Like the the need to be better and to prove something, like that's a part of Anakin he didn't really have to purge because that was never a good side of Anakin, right? And so he's purged all of Anakin that he needs to. But that's that's really still a part of Anakin that 
I got beaten by this guy and I don't like that. And I need to prove something, right? He makes that comment. I'm the master now, right? I, yeah. I wasn't, but now I am. And now I'm going to show you like, that's a very Anakin thing that we see at the end of episode three. Um, yeah. So even in that, like we still see elements of who Anakin was in Vader, just not in good ways. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But yeah, I, I love seeing how well these things have blended together, even though it was not necessarily planned out. I think a lot of it worked out really well. Yeah, it certainly wasn't planned out in 1977 when <laughs> this movie came out. But that's no. the benefit of getting to work backwards through things. You you get to have this story that makes sense, and then you get to say, oh, here's a little bit of piece of info we have. Let's make a Disney Plus series on that. Yeah. And you can Flesh just it take out. it and pull it out and put in all the information you need and then plug it right yeah. back on the bookshelf, and it's even better than it was before. Yep. So sure. that's that's definitely an aspect of this movie that I like. Going from where Anakin Vader was and Kenobi to where he is now, it just flows so well. So he does get that revenge on Obi-Wan in, mm -hmm. in that duel on the Death Star, but he, he ultimately doesn't win because Luke and Leia and Han and, and, and Chewie get away. And so he's so caught up in this rage to, to win this fight that he ultimately does lose the war because of it. But, Looking at that duel, if you read the From a Certain Point of View book, the A New Hope one, Obi-Wan, it's his point of view for, for when Vader kills him, and it just goes mm -hmm. through the whole loop of him becoming a Force ghost. But you get the the um, information that Anakin is just toying with Obi-Wan as they're fighting. Mm. So he's holding back. Obi-Wan knows he's holding back. He's just testing Obi-Wan to see how brittle he is, how old he is, how far he's fallen. And every blow, Obi-Wan's just doing all he can to, yeah. to keep up. And so that entire fight was not truly a fight at all. Vader knew he was going to strike yeah. Obi-Wan down. Obi-Wan knew Vader was going to strike him down. But Anakin gets his revenge on Obi-Wan here. And... And that really, the same sense of, of brashness and having to be just so in the moment is what loses him this, this dogfight that he has with Luke Skywalker over the mm -hmm. Death Star just a few hours later. We see the Rebels launch the attack on the Death Star because they have the plans, so Vader loses by letting those plans escape. So anger gets in the way of that. Vader is... is in this dogfight with Luke Skywalker and these rebels. And we see that Anakin is still pretty good pilot as well, but he gets caught off guard by Han Solo coming in on the millennium Falcon and the death star is destroyed while Vader is away. And this next great rivalry begins between the father and the son, which we'll ultimately pick up next week with empire strikes back. Yeah. Cause he, he doesn't know who Luke is. He picks Not up yet. that he is strong in the force, which I think is cool. Cause I feel like for Vader to make that comment, it has to be significant because he's been killing Jedi, right? Like yep. he's not going to make that comment just cause somebody's force sensitive, right? He's, he's picking up that this is somebody who has a pretty significant connection to the force. So um, yeah, I, I, that's a cool way that that kind of rivalry between them begins. And then he's going to go try to find out who this, pilot is who's destroyed the death star i think it's that's certainly a, a callback to episode <clears throat> one where anakin blows up the the, yeah, the, the separatist the trade federation ship. Yeah. droid ship like technically the episode one thing is a callback to episode four but if you're going in chronological yeah. order <laughs> that's just another way that the father and the son are very yeah. similar. They start out on this Jedi journey and they blow up a big ship while they're doing it. So <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool how that works. So do you have anything else to add for Darth Vader here? Because this story, I th we've talked a lot about a lot of different things, but this story itself, it's at surface level. It's a little bit shallow in that its main point is this Death Star. You don't get a whole lot into the other stuff yeah. but because we know all this other information. We've thrown it in, but yeah. without it, you don't necessarily have a ton of character development and information and stuff. It's just a starting point because you have to remember episode four was the starting point of Star Wars. 
Yeah. It, yeah. No, you're right. I think most of our discussion has been based off of information we had leading into this about who Vader is, who Anakin Skywalker is, because he's really not. He's he's an integral part of this movie, but he's not a large part of this movie. He shows up in a few instances and does some pretty significant things. But really, this movie is it's about Luke and Leia, like this idea of this growing hope and this rebellion. And so he he does kind of take a back seat in this movie, like he's established as as a big bad villain. Yeah. Um, but like you said earlier, really, the Death Star's the looming threat here. Um, and Tarkin, even in some ways, is 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 really the driving force behind that, not Vader. Yeah. And so he really steps into that role, like you said, in the next movie, where it's much more about him and then, of course, and Luke. So, Yeah, and just, I think after this discussion, we went a, a lot over what we typically do, but it's because <laughs> there's a lot to talk about. Like, there is, yeah. I don't think until just right now, I've I've really understood just how great all these add-on projects are, because... Episode four is is so good, yeah. and it was not one of my favorite movies probably before all of these. But now, with just all this other information thrown in from from Rebels to Kenobi to to Rogue One to Andor, we'll eventually get to that point. It makes Episode four just this this big wholesome movie that all these yeah. stories are leading up to. It's like the it's like the the yeah. last movie of a saga talking about the Death Star and Obi Wan story. You could look at it as the conclusion of that story. So I really like it when you look at it from that range or that perspective. I think that's a really good point too, because I I think we tend to have too high a standard sometimes for what we expect a TV show to do. Because no, not I mean, Star how Wars often fans. is there a how often is there a Star Wars or, or just a show in general that just hits it out of the park? Everything about it's perfect. Like there are those shows, but they're rare. And so what you can say about all these shows is they did add something of value to the lore, right? To the, to contribute to the story. And so in that sense, like these shows have a, done a good job of enriching things, even when certain aspects may not have been people's favorite, they're, they're still adding to the story in a meaningful way, which I, that that's a great point. I think that's definitely worth mentioning. Yeah, for sure. So wrapping this up, the what did our wives think segment's going to be super <laughs> short. Um, this is Ashley's favorite movie of the original trilogy, so just enjoyed watching it. This is uh, this is probably the movie I laughed the most at. I, there are several <laughs> moments in this movie that I just I genuinely find funny. And so it was fun to hear Brittany actually laughing and chuckling instead of rolling her eyes, because that was... That was her response to a lot of the humor in the prequels. So, I, yeah, it was I, I think she definitely it vibed with it a whole lot more than than those, especially yeah. with some of the writing. Well, Rogue One is Ashley's favorite Star Wars movie. So it makes sense that with with A New Hope being like her favorite of all the the episodic Star Wars films, probably that that Rogue One would be her favorite yeah. Star Wars movie as like a whole. So, movies. yeah, she loves it. And so a few <laughs> Pieces of information before we finish. Just real quick rundown. Midi chlorian count on Anakin Skywalker. Mm. I don't know if this is legitimate or not because I just Google searched it, but I'm looking at twenty seven thousand midi chlorians <laughs> for Anakin. I'm looking at Leia and Luke both having twenty three thousand midi chlorians. Is that yeah. accurate? I have no clue, but they no are idea. just According to this website that's on the internet, and I know that everything on the internet is true, Anakin is slightly ahead of Luke and Leia. Tidbit number two, we hardly talked about them, but Han Solo, Chewbacca, R2-D2, C-3PO, y'all are amazing. Sorry we don't yes. talk about you more, but we're looking at the Skywalkers, and Han, you don't have anything to do with Skywalkers for two more movies, so... We're going to get there, just not yep. yet. So. Yeah. And I, I know Harrison Ford hates Star Wars, but he is so good as Han Solo. <laughs> he just kind of hates everything. So That's true. He's kind of well, got he, that. He loves he, Indiana Jones. That's his he baby. He does. Yeah, that's one thing that he does love. But yeah, no, that's that's funny. Yeah, and, and with I, Harrison... I hate, I hate chlorians, by the way. Just throw yeah. that out there. Let's go ahead and get that out of the way. I hate it. Good. I, I'm okay with him. I'm okay with him now. I'm, I'm not... I think it overly complicates something that didn't need to be complicated just for the sake of saying how powerful someone was. So 
That is fair. I love but Star I, Wars. I love it. Everything about it. Hate midichlorians. So that's funny. <laughs> so with with Han Solo too, just a little tidbit. We're going to talk a ton about Han Solo when he gets to episode seven, because that's where he really picks up the Skywalker part of the story there. So I'm yeah. I'm looking forward to that as well. Han yeah. will get his justice. So yeah. that was a lot. We're at 51 minutes yeah. recording 52. It'll, it was it'll probably be around like 45 ish by the time it's edited. But thank you guys so much for watching. If you haven't already, go ahead and like this video and subscribe. I try to put out Star Wars content daily. So that will definitely help us get this out there. Check us out on Spotify as well. If you're there, you can look it up. It's Force With Friends podcast. You can find all of our episodes. If you would rather listen to us instead of look at us, we certainly understand that. And so yeah. you can do that as well. Otherwise, thanks for watching and may the force be with you.